Hi, it's Katrina. Creepy Ancient Dolls Archaeologists working in Siberia have made a very disturbing discovery involving a child's grave and some of the creepiest toys known to exist anywhere on the planet. The grave and the toys date back to the Bronze Age, left behind by members of the Okunev culture. These people are related to Native Americans and are famous for their skills working with bronze and copper to make all kinds of weapons and tools. The artifacts discovered inside the child's gravesite include the heads from dolls and a mysterious animal figurine, all of which have been dated at 4,500 years old. The heads of the dolls were crafted from a type of soapstone, which is naturally soft. According to one of the archaeologists working with the project, Andrei Polyakov, the facial features were carefully carved into the doll's head, which might be why they look so creepy. As for the animal figurine, it was carved from a different material, either antler or horn, but which animal the figurine was supposed to represent is unclear. Also unclear is what the toys were supposed to be used for. The child was buried as a commoner without any other artifacts of value, indicating that the child was not part of an elite social class. The toys may have held some kind of symbolic purpose, or they may have even just been used as ordinary children's toys, though by today's standards, they are pretty ghoulish. Elite Mutilations Archaeologists have discovered something strange and very creepy involving an ancient culture that lived near the Irongu Cave in what is modern-day Gabon in Africa. Researchers investigated 28 skeletons dated back to between the 14th and 15th centuries, buried inside the cave. What they discovered was that elite members of the culture purposely mutilated their faces. The expedition involved a team of French scientists and Gabonese researchers. They found evidence of what is known as cultural tooth ablation, or the modification of the face through the removal of teeth. In other words, the people buried in the cave had ripped their own teeth out in order to change the way their faces looked. By removing certain teeth, facial characteristics could be dramatically altered. Mostly, these people removed the upper incisors or the front teeth. Just imagine how painful it would be as an adult to rip out perfectly healthy front teeth with no drugs or anesthetic. It would be excruciating. And yet, the top members of society did it just to have a unique look, probably with some sort of ceremony. At least that's what archaeologists believe. They don't know the exact reason for the self-mutilations, and it's unclear if all the members of society did the same thing especially because the skeletons found inside the cave hadn't really been buried. They were either thrown into the cavernous underground or slowly lowered into its darkness as part of a ceremony. Mass Ritual Sacrifice Archaeologists have uncovered evidence of a mass ritual sacrifice from 15th century Peru. This is one of the largest ritual killings known to historians. Evidence from the site in Peru shows that at least 140 children along with 200 llamas had been brutally sacrificed at the exact same time. To date, this is the largest known mass sacrifice of children, and indeed of llamas, anywhere in the Americas. What makes the discovery so strange is that there hasn't been a lot of evidence of child sacrifice from the northern coast of Peru. This was a bit of a shock to researchers who were investigating the Huanchaquito Las Llamas site in the Chimú state named after the Chimu culture that lived in the area from between 900 to 1470 AD. The excavations went on from between 2011 to 2016, with almost every human skeleton found being that of a child. The animals were almost all juveniles as well, and included some alpacas along with the llamas. The oldest child sacrificed here was 14 years old, with the youngest being only five. Researchers still aren't sure what the point of the mass sacrifice was, Perhaps there had been a great environmental disaster, and the Chimu were desperately trying to appease the gods. During this time, there was heavy rainfall and flooding, indicating the area was going through a major natural disaster. The researchers said this archaeological discovery was a huge surprise to all of them. They hadn't seen anything like this before. An important theory is that the leaders were so afraid they decided to sacrifice their most precious things to the gods to plead for them to stop. Roman Slave Callers there have been some disturbing archaeological discoveries coming out of Rome recently. Archaeologists have found a total of 45 surviving slave collars that date back to Rome during the 4th and 5th centuries. Several slave collars have been found in Italy and a handful from some cities in North Africa where Rome held great influence. This is a grim reminder of how brutal the Roman Empire really was. Each collar was engraved with the name of the slave owner and their address 
kind of like a modern-day dog collar. These were used by the Roman slave masters in case somebody ran away, was captured, and needed to be returned. The Zoninus collar is the most important Roman slave collar ever discovered, because it is the only surviving example of a tag still hanging through its neck ring. The collar is made from iron and bronze, with the pendant tag cut from a sheet of bronze. On the collar is written, I fled, hold me. Bring me to my master Zoninus, and you will receive coin as a reward. It's unclear exactly where the collar came from, who was forced to wear it, or who exactly the master Zoninus was, but it's the best example of the Roman slave obsession. Roman slave masters would either use collars like these as punishment, or they would tattoo a person's face with the same instructions. Egyptian Book of Spells A mysterious book of spells from Egypt has finally been deciphered, revealing some very creepy information about how ancient Egyptian priests went about their business. Researchers have called it the Handbook of Ritual Power, not unlike the legendary Necronomicon. The book has spells that can teach a person how to fall in love, how to get rid of evil spirits, and even how to treat the bacterial infection known as black jaundice, something that's actually still around today. The Egyptian Book of Spells is about 1300 years old and was written in Coptic, one of the oldest Egyptian languages. Don't want to disappoint you, but contrary to popular belief, the book was not actually made out of human skin. Instead, it was bound normally with its pages being made of parchment. There are only 20 pages in the book, but according to the researchers from the University of Sydney in Australia, it was one of the most important tools for any ritual practitioner. First of all, the book details a series of invocations, complete with drawings, to summon power. Next, spells and cures, how to deal with possession and spirits, and then how to have a successful life in love and business. There's a fine line between a scam artist's self-help book and a mysterious tome of powerful spells. It's important to note also that while this book was written in Coptic, it was made at a time when much of Egypt was becoming Christian, a few hundred years after Christ's death. Many of the spells actually invoke the name of Jesus, creating a mysterious spiritual book combining ancient Egyptian mysticism with Christianity. Ritual Snakeheads In Ukraine, archaeologists have discovered some creepy artifacts, and they don't quite know what they mean. Two weirdly shaped rocks have been identified as carved serpent heads that were likely used in some kind of ritual. At first glance, the rocks just look like any other rocks. It wasn't until archaeologists from the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine took a closer look that they realized an artist in the Stone Age had carved them to look like the heads of serpents. The stone snakes were found in 2016 during excavations at an archaeological site called Kamyana Moila 1. They were found near flint tools and ancient bones from the Mesolithic period, right in the middle of the Stone Age, or about 8300 BC, nearly 10,000 years ago. The snake heads are small, only about 5 inches long. Each stone head was found by a fireplace, suggesting whatever they had been used for required fire. Unfortunately, the archaeologists don't even know much about the Stone Age residents of the area. These are prehistoric people who left nothing behind except for rock carvings and their own worn bones. It was a society of hunters and gatherers, though the presence of ritual snakeheads says they had cultural traditions that were more complicated than just picking berries and killing deer. Archaeologists just can't figure out what exactly those traditions were, or why they had such an obsession with snakes. But first, want to give a big shout out to Amanda Via and Angel Evan. Thanks so much for supporting this channel. If you want to learn more about new discoveries in archaeology, make sure that you are subscribed and turn that notification bell on. Greek Curse Tablets An ancient grave was discovered near Athens that contains one of the creepiest collections of artifacts in history. When archaeologists excavated the mysterious grave, they found the cremated remains of a young girl, along with five lead tablets which looked like they were used to curse people. The grave dates back to 2,400 years ago, but nobody can figure out who the dead girl was, or what happened to her that she would be able to curse people in death. The tablets were found engraved with curses that were to be cast on four different tavern keepers in the city of Athens. These were mom and pop shops, owned by a husband and wife. The curses were meant to destroy these people's businesses and bring them great misfortune, maybe even death. But how did the curse tablets work? Written upon the stone were the names of gods of the underworld. Since the young girl was buried with the tablets, the gods of the underworld would have no choice but to look at them once she passed through to their domain, then hopefully curse the living. 
There was even a blank tablet which someone had likely spoken an incantation over as a verbal curse that would become stuck inside the stone. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened to make somebody so furious with the local tavern owners in Athens, and we also don't know if the curses ever worked. So far, this is one of the most extreme examples of somebody trying to beseech the gods of the underworld for their help in destroying the living. Kindergarten Burial Grounds A group of kindergarten students turned into unlikely archaeologists when they came across a disturbing discovery on the playground. These unlucky toddlers in France accidentally dug old human remains out of the dirt, causing a bit of a panic. After all, it's not every day that kids find dead bodies on the playground. As it turns out, their school had been built over an ancient burial ground. A real ancient one, not one from urban legend. It's unlikely any of the kids are going to be cursed for uncovering the bones, but it was still pretty freaky. According to Live Science, the bones were dated at over 5,500 years old. After the initial discovery, archaeologists descended onto school in droves. The mound was quickly excavated and 30 bodies were exhumed. Amazingly, they were less than two feet deep meaning the children had been playing on top of the remains for years with nothing between them except a handful of dirt. The remains are so old and span such a long period of time that it looks like many cultures would come to this place year after year to bury their dead. Ritual Bowls An ancient ritual bowl was just discovered inside of a tomb in China, dating back 3,100 years. The bronze bowl looks extraordinarily strange more like a collar with spikes coming off its side that are pointy enough to stab through a person's skin. The bowl is also decorated in curious geometric patterns and unknown symbols. It was found beside a decomposed body that likely belonged to a warrior chief. The bowl and the tomb were part of a much larger discovery made near Baoji City, in which archaeologists discovered roughly 57 tombs from the Chao Dynasty, which came before the more popular Qin Dynasty. Archaeologists aren't quite sure what the ritual bowl was used for, and there were actually dozens of them found in various graves. They say the bowls could have been spoils of war taken after the Chao brutally defeated the Shang dynasty. Archaeologists also say the bowls weren't for eating or drinking out of, but were instead used for some kind of ritual. Pompeii Victims In August of 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted and destroyed the ancient Italian city of Pompeii. For 1,700 years, the unfortunate citizens of the city were buried under 30 feet of mud and ash. Until excavations began in the 1800s, they remained entombed and in perfect condition, exactly the way they had been when the volcanic blast cooked them alive. But here's something some people don't know about the victims of Pompeii. When excavators began uncovering the human remains, they realized that their skeletons were covered in compact ash, and that by pouring a plaster mix into the hollow spaces of their ashen armor, they could preserve them like statues in their final poses. Roughly 1,150 bodies have been discovered so far in Pompeii, with only about three quarters of the site being fully excavated even after 200 years. The plaster casts were only made in the 1800s, as scientists eventually realized that the plaster was damaging the fragile corpses. In that short time span, the archaeologists created their very own creepy Pompeii mummies. Many of these plaster citizens are still at the Pompeii site, enclosed in glass boxes for the world to see. With their faces hardened in plaster, forever stuck in the soundless screams of their final moments, these are some of the most ghoulish mummies anywhere in the world. Han Dynasty Tomb While blasting rocks at a quarrying site in Yangzhou City, China during the 1970s, workers noticed a hole they couldn't explain. An archaeological team reported to the site and found an ancient tomb that had been damaged by explosives. As they worked to salvage the site, they assumed that they were digging up an ordinary grave. But as they continued to unearth artifacts, they realized that they were working with a royal burial. They eventually determined that the tomb belonged to the son of the Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty, dating back to around the 1st century BC. Liu Shu was Emperor Wu's fourth son. Historical records describe him as being tall and strong, and capable of wrestling with bears, boars, and other animals single-handedly. His tomb was built 82 feet into an extinct volcano, known as the Heavenly Mountain. Lifting out the debris and the ancient tomb was no small feat, but luckily archaeologists were able to lift it out without it falling apart. After archaeologists excavated the site, it was remodeled to represent what it would have looked like around the time of Liu Shu's burial. 
Missing Franklin Expedition Member During the 19th century, European explorers competed to find a polar sea route linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, known as the Northwest Passage. In the most historically famous and doomed expedition, 128 crew members set sail in 1845 under Captain Sir John Franklin. Sadly, nobody survived. For the first time, experts recently confirmed the identity of a crew member's remains through DNA. Jonathan Gregory, who lives in South Africa, was found to be the great-great-great-grandson of Warrant Officer John Gregory, who traveled aboard the ill-fated HMS Erebus. During the journey, the Erebus and its sister ship, the HMS Terror, became icebound. The crews tried to wait for the ice to break up and melt, but they eventually gave up even though they had set sail with enough food to last them a while longer. After being stranded in the ice for two years, they abandoned ship in hopes of making it back to civilization on foot. The men died in different places and at different times throughout the remainder of their quest for survival. People back in Europe were unaware of just how bad things had gotten until Franklin and his men failed to return, and the circumstances of the expedition have long been a mystery. Identifying crew members' remains can help researchers piece this perplexing puzzle together. Author Russell Potter, who wrote a book about the Franklin Expedition, told CBC that if experts can identify some more people, they can start to make other connections that will hopefully get them closer to finding out exactly what happened on the voyage. Ancient Quarry The Israel Antiquities Authority recently announced the discovery of a 2,000-year-old quarry. Found at a site called Har Hotzvim, which is Hebrew for Quarrymen's Hill, archaeologists came across it by accident while excavating ahead of a construction project. At the quarry, they uncovered several building blocks. Thousands of them were cut and transported to Jerusalem during the quarry's operating years. The blocks were used for large-scale construction projects during ancient times, and finding the building blocks in their original site reveals a lot about ancient technology and what people used to extract and carve rocks 2,000 years ago. The research team plans to actually mimic these ancient methods using replicas of the tools that the ancients used during the Second Temple period, when they built numerous magnificent structures. Oldest Money Minting Mold New research shows that the world's first known minting site was in the ancient city of Guangzhou, China. The city center was home to production facilities for bronze, jade, and bone items, including weapons, instruments, tools, vessels, and money, apparently. During excavations, archaeologists found spade coins, which are long thought to be one of the first forms of coinage in existence. Located near the Yellow River in the country's central plains, the settlement dates back to around 800 BC and was inhabited until 450 BC. The origins of spade coins were a mystery until the team discovered clay casts that were used for manufacturing them amongst the ruins of the city's bronze foundry. Dating back to sometime between 640 and 500 BC, the cast make Guangzhou the world's oldest known reliably dated minting site. Spade coin production was highly standardized. It was done on a large scale and in a very planned and organized fashion, according to the new research. The currency circulated throughout the region until Emperor Qin Shi Huang abolished it in 221 BC. The rise of a money economy changed the world in major ways that we still experience the effects of in our daily lives. Learning more about early coins and money and why it was developed in the first place can help experts better understand modern humanity's exhausting and sometimes obsessive relationship with money. Plague Cemetery Things took a gruesome turn this summer at a construction site in northern Poland when workers stumbled upon human remains. Archaeologists ended up finding two graveyards including one that dates back between the 17th and 19th centuries, and another from the 18th century when the plague hit the region. Historical records show that the plague cemetery was created when there was not enough room for graves outside a local church, according to a local archaeologist. Now, experts believe they have finally found the site. Entire families were buried at the plague cemetery. So far, the team has unearthed 60 graves containing the remains of 100 people. Hundreds of thousands of people died in the epidemic known as the Great Northern War Plague. The disease ravaged Poland and other parts of Central Eastern Europe from 1700 to 1721. The recently discovered victims' remains will undergo scientific testing and will probably be reburied in a mass grave. 
Archaeologists also found the remains of a Neolithic settlement at the site and artifacts dating back to Roman times, letting us know that this place has been important practically since the dawn of humanity. Ancient Artwork While excavating the ancient city of Dicilium in northwestern Turkey earlier this year, a team of researchers unearthed some ancient reliefs depicting the Greeks and Persians at war. Dating back to the 5th century BC, the artwork shows Greek soldiers being trampled on by Persian war horses, according to excavation leader Khan Irin. The reason this find is so exciting is because the 2,500-year-old images were probably created as propaganda during the Greco-Persian Wars. They were made to show people the might of the empire. The conflicts lasted from 499 BC to 449 BC and were fought between the Achaemenid, or Persian Empire, and an alliance of Greek city-states called the Delian League. The team also uncovered a stone and mud brick wall dating back to the 8th century BC. They believe that the Phrygian civilization built the wall to protect themselves from invaders and that it was somewhere between 23 and 26 feet high. Healing Cult Goddess Archaeologists also working in modern-day Turkey have found a headless marble statue of Hygieia, the Greco-Roman goddess of health and cleanliness. The life-size sculpture was found in the ancient city of Izanoi, which is home to one of Anatolia's best-preserved temples. Like many ancient civilizations, the Greeks relied on gods and goddesses to protect their health. From 500 BC to around 500 AD, Athens was home to a healing cult dedicated to Hygieia and the medical god Asclepius. The cult grew considerably after a plague hit Greece during the 5th century BC. The pain and suffering caused by the disease made many people turn to them for help. By the 2nd century AD, the cult had spread to Rome. The Greeks put sculptures of Hygieia inside temples dedicated to Asclepius. These statues often showed her holding or feeding a snake, which is the Greek symbol for medicine. Elements of Greco-Roman culture reached Izanoi in 133 BC, when Rome conquered the region. The city's population peaked under Roman rule between the 2nd and 3rd centuries. At the time, it was home to somewhere between 80,000 and 100,000 residents. In addition to the recently discovered statue of Hygieia, archaeologists have unearthed a stadium, theater, gymnasium, several bridges, and more. The Disappearing Tomb While excavating an ancient tomb in Sande on Scotland's Orkney Islands, archaeologists found two rare carved stone balls. The 5,500-year-old grave is located on a cliff, but it's disappearing due to erosion from the sea. For the past four years, experts have been working tirelessly to preserve the deteriorating tomb before it's lost to history. They don't know what the stone balls were for, but they may have been weapons. It's also possible that they were ceremonial objects, leatherworking tools, or used for fortune-telling or to move construction blocks. Archaeologist Vicky Cummings explained that the tomb may be linked to a nearby Neolithic settlement. In addition to the stone balls, the team unearthed bone and pottery fragments, knives, pot lids, human and animal remains, and more. Around 500 of the stone balls have been found in Scotland, but only 20 or so have been discovered in the Orkney Islands. They have also appeared in other parts of Britain and Ireland, making them even more mysterious. What do you think the stone balls were for? Let me know in the comments below. World War II Wreck Researchers recently identified a wreck in the Southern Irish Sea as the World War II minesweeper HMS Mercury. Until recently, researchers believed the wreck was a submarine. But high-quality sonar data showed that the vessel had a boxed paddle wheel with dimensions that match the Mercury's paddle wheel in marine archives. There are more than 300 wrecks in the area, so researchers have their work cut out for them. Built in 1934 as a passenger ferry, the vessel was repurposed just five years later for service in the war. In 1940, the minesweeper was damaged while trying to clear a mine. The entire crew was rescued, and initially, it seemed like the ship could possibly be saved. But the tow rope pulling the mercury broke while the vessel was en route to a shipyard, and it sank vertically to the bottom of the sea. The discovery was made as part of an ongoing project to identify wrecks in the Irish Sea. Scientists are racing against the clock to get the job done before any of the sunken vessels are lost forever. Biblical Earthquake the books of Zechariah and Amos from the Christian Bible talk about an earthquake that happened in Jerusalem around the time when King Uzziah ruled over the kingdom of Judah and Jeroboam had power over Israel. 
The IAA announced this year that it had found evidence of an earthquake actually happening around that time, which would have been roughly 2,800 years ago. Evidence of the earthquake has turned up elsewhere in the past, but this was the first time archaeologists discovered signs of it in Jerusalem proper. While excavating in the City of David National Park, the team found a layer of destruction from when a building's wall collapsed. The layer contained shattered vessels, bowls, lamps, cooking utensils, and jars, according to the IAA's Facebook page. In their words, the earthquake was probably one of the strongest and most damaging earthquakes in ancient times. The natural disaster was remembered for hundreds of years afterward. Nevertheless, people continue to come to Jerusalem to live in the city built on top of the rubble. Number 2. Danish Treasure Hoard In one of the most incredible archaeological discoveries in Denmark's history, a metal detectorist discovered a kilo of 1,500-year-old gold jewelry. Located near the town of Yelling, it's one of the largest treasure hoards ever found in the country, and it dates back to before the beginning of the Viking Age. Altogether, there are 22 items in the collection. They date back to the 6th century, and the artifacts are quite special because they bear symbols, runes, and motifs that have never been seen before. A wealthy man buried the items in a longhouse during the Iron Age, indicating that the area was once a center of power. He may have deposited the artifacts as an offering to the gods during a stressful period of climate change. In the year 536, a volcano erupted in Iceland, causing Northern Europe's climate to cool considerably. The discovery happened last year, but it was kept secret until recently. The treasure will go on display at a public museum next year, so everyone can go and visit it for themselves. Shark Teeth Archaeologists working at a 2,900-year-old site in Jerusalem City of David recently unearthed 29 fossilized shark teeth dating back roughly 80 million years, when the dinosaurs still roamed the Earth. A recently published study on the artifacts concluded that a person transported them to Jerusalem, but researchers are unsure exactly how or why. The teeth may have been part of a collection and were discovered at a site called the Rock Cut Pool, along with fish bones, seals called bulle, which were used for sealing confidential documents, and other discarded materials dating back to the time of King Solomon. Someone in the ancient world might also have really loved collecting fossils. Speaking at this year's Goldschmidt conference, lead researchers said that the shark teeth were probably valuable to someone, but the team doesn't know why. They resemble other fossilized shark fossils found in the Negev Desert over 50 miles away, and come from several ancient species, including the extinct Squalicorax group. The researchers initially thought the teeth were part of an array of food waste dumped at the site, but a reviewer of their work pointed out that they could have only come from a long extinct late Cretaceous shark. Similar teeth have been found at other archaeological sites throughout Israel and are also believed to be sourced and transported from elsewhere. Mysterious Ancient Tunnel Archaeologists are constantly making exciting discoveries in the ancient Mesoamerican city of Teotihuacan, which is located near modern-day Mexico City. Some of their most fascinating finds in recent years came in 2014, when archaeologists ventured into a tunnel and came out with thousands of artifacts. Before the team went inside, the 340-foot-long tunnel had been sealed and left untouched for some 2,000 years. It was originally discovered in 2003, but it took 11 years for researchers to raise enough money to explore it. The entrance was covered with rocks, suggesting that it was sealed on purpose. As the archaeologists painstakingly worked their way through, they found statues, pottery, seeds, seashells, animal bones, and more. The site sits 59 feet beneath the Temple of the Plumed Serpent and is surrounded by the remains of hundreds of sacrificial victims. Near the tunnel's entrance, the team found a large offering that they suspected might be an elite person's tomb, but they did not come across any remains belonging to Teotihuacan's rulers. In a statement, excavation leader Sergio Gomez said that he still hoped to find human remains. This makes sense since the archaeologists had only dug about two feet into the tunnel by then but there's been no new sense about any royals being discovered. The burial place of Teotihuacan's leaders is a long-standing mystery, and the tunnel seemed like a promising location. Discovering these tombs would be incredibly helpful for learning more about the ancient city's history, especially since they left no written records behind. But the search is ongoing, 
And for now, experts have no choice but to work with the information they have when it comes to understanding the people who built and lived in Teotihuacan. New Discoveries Near Stonehenge Earlier this year, archaeologists made several breakthrough discoveries while excavating near Stonehenge ahead of a road tunnel project in Wiltshire, England. The findings include Bronze Age graves, Neolithic pottery, and the remnants of a C-shaped structure that once stood at the site. Inside a 4,000-year-old burial, the team found a shale object that may have been part of a club or a staff. A baby was buried nearby with a beaker and nothing else. The C-shaped structure is surrounded by ditches that contain burnt flint, indicating that the ancient people who built the site used it for metal or leatherworking, or perhaps some other sort of trade. A collection of Neolithic pottery that the team found may have been left by the people who visited Stonehenge, or the builders themselves. Consultant archaeologist Matt Leavers told The Guardian that the artifacts show that people lived in the area over a several thousand year span. He described the objects as traces of people's everyday lives and deaths, intimate things. Leavers also pointed out that each new discovery helps piece together a picture of what happened at the site throughout this vast time period. Many people oppose the road tunnel project because they believe it could interfere with the valuable ancient landscape and cause hundreds of thousands of artifacts to be lost. Those in charge of the project have promised to go about it carefully and respectfully, but some say that it's not enough and filed a lawsuit challenging the plans. Plans to build the tunnel were recently suspended, perhaps giving archaeologists some more time to search for more evidence left behind by our Neolithic ancestors. How Stone Age People Painted in the Dark The earliest human artists created a lot of paintings in caves, places that lacked natural light. Since people can't see in the dark, this begs the question of how they made their artwork. Archaeologists in Spain set out to solve this mystery by searching for evidence of how ancient humans may have made torches and lamps from wood and other flammable materials. After all, even the best artist needs to be able to see what they're working on. Study author Diego Garate said that charcoal remains at prehistoric cave sites were often overlooked by experts, but have a lot to tell us about how our ancestors created their images. Relying as much as possible on Paleolithic-era evidence, the team created their own torches and grease lamps. They made five wooden torches using a mixture of dried juniper wood, birch bark, ivy, pine resin, and deer bone marrow, and two grease lamps containing dried juniper wood, cow bone marrow, and resin. The researchers also put together a small fireplace with various types of bark and wood. Garate described the light that the torches and lamps created as different from modern-day artificial light. The torches burned for anywhere from 21 to 61 minutes. They were unpredictable, made a lot of smoke, and often had to be relit. The grease lamps, on the other hand, were useful for staying in one place, but not for moving through the cave, and the fireplace was smoky and burned fast. While the team can't say that they know for sure how Stone Age people lit up their workspace, they concluded that prehistoric humans were experts at navigating through caves. In fact, they were probably better at it than we tend to give them credit for, since moving through these environments is incredibly difficult, even with modern equipment. Sword Pyramid While searching for treasure in Norfolk, England, an amateur metal detectorist named Jamie Harcourt discovered a gold and garnet sword pyramid that may have belonged to a wealthy lord or early medieval king. It resembles similar artifacts found at the nearby Sutton Hoo burial, also known as England's Valley of the Kings. The Sword Pyramid dates back to sometime between 560 and 630 AD. At the time, England was part of a kingdom called East Anglia. While sword pyramids are typically found in pairs, this one was discovered alone. Its owner may have lost it during their travels throughout the countryside. The pyramid measures less than half an inch on each side of its base. There are two distinct designs on its four faces, which feature garnets that may have been imported from India or Sri Lanka. Helen Geek, who works for the Portable Antiquities Scheme as a Fines Liaison Officer, told the BBC that the artifact speaks to the far-reaching trade networks that existed between Europe and Asia during the 6th and 7th centuries. She also said that losing one of a pair of sword pyramids is like losing an earring. How annoying is that? Interestingly, the Sword Pyramid was found in a place that is not a known archaeological site. These so-called stray finds are becoming increasingly common, according to PAS. Experts believe that Sword Pyramids were used for keeping weapons sheathed, but they don't know for sure. New Human Lineage 
Over 7,000 years ago, an ancient woman from the Toalian culture was laid to rest with her knees drawn to her chest on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. Her body and the sides of her head were adorned with large rocks from a nearby river. Indonesian archaeologists discovered the burial in a limestone cavern in 2015. Nicknamed Bese, the woman provided the first DNA from a period of early migration from Asia to Australia. She also bears evidence of an Asian lineage that experts didn't know about until now. The group appears to have entered southern Sulawesi after the first people arrived in Papua New Guinea and Australia, according to Adam Brum, who co-authored a study on the findings. Brum says that the Toalians were a fairly isolated group of hunter-gatherers who lived on Sulawesi from 8,000 to 1,500 years ago. Bese was 17 years old when she lived and died between 7,300 and 7,200 years ago. Her bones left no signs of injury, infection, or any other obvious cause of death. Bese is one of just three ancient skeletons from the region that scientists have managed to extract DNA from. Her DNA was badly degraded, and only 2% of her genetic information was retrieved from it. But it was enough to learn that she shared roughly half her DNA with indigenous Australian and Papuan people. This points to a possible wave of migration through the region among the people who were the first to arrive in Australia and Papua New Guinea. But the rest of Bese's DNA comes from an unknown population that originated in Asia. Experts are unsure whether there are living descendants of this group or if it died out. But they do know that the woman's genetic information is unlike that of the people living on Sulawesi today. Viking Amulet Factory In certain parts of Europe, including Denmark, England, and Russia, archaeologists have found ancient bronze figurines of long-haired women holding swords and shields. They long struggled to come up with an explanation for the artifacts, which date back over 1,000 years to the Viking Age. Researchers initially concluded that the amulets represented mythical warrior women called Valkyries, which the ancient Scandinavians believed carried fallen warriors to the afterlife. Archaeologist Peter Jan Deckers and his colleagues recently challenged this theory, arguing that these small figurines represent real women who played important roles in Viking ceremonies. They also theorize that the artifacts are part of a larger collection of ritual objects that point toward complex gender roles in Viking Age Europe. The researchers cited the 2017 discovery of an early 9th century jewelry workshop on the western coast of Denmark as evidence. It appears as though Vikings used clay molds to craft bronze figurines at the site. In addition to producing Valkyrie amulets, the workshop made figurines of men and everyday non-mythical items like wheels and horses. Speaking with National Geographic, study co-author and archaeologist Sarah Croix said that the amulets do not necessarily represent warrior women. Instead, she suggested that the figurines convey blurred gender lines. For example, many feature women holding weapons and men pulling on their long hair. While these artifacts are still largely a mystery, in the ancient world there wasn't always a clear line separating the feminine from the masculine. Rare Grave Goods While excavating an ancient burial mound in Russia's Caucasia Republic, archaeologists discovered the unusually well-preserved burial dating back 1,700 years. The grave belonged to a woman and one other person from the Tashtik culture. It contained organic objects that typically deteriorate over time, including items made from wood, bark, and cloth, so archaeologists were really excited. Pieces of a plaster mask that fell apart over time were found by the woman's skull. Scientists are currently trying to restore it. A decomposed doll discovered near her body contained the cremated remains of another person. The grave also contained a collection of goods, including vials, an ornamented barrel, an object resembling a small tub, and a mysterious object that archaeologists call the box. Mirage News reported that it could take years for experts to finish studying and running tests on the items, but they hope to learn more about the enigmatic Tashtik people. The culture lived in southern Siberia between the 1st and 7th centuries during the Iron Age. Their lifestyle revolved around agriculture and livestock, but little else is known about them. Underworld Carvings Around 3,200 years ago, someone who lived in what is now Turkey made a series of stone carvings of an ancient calendar and map of the cosmos. The artwork depicts what appears to be an underworld beneath the Earth. While the artwork was discovered in 1834, experts only recently deciphered some of the 90 or so images, which include animals, gods, and mythical creatures. Drawings of sun and storm goddesses sit higher than other images, 
including depictions of the lunar and seasonal phases, a temple, and ordinary people. Images of the underworld, including dedications to the god of the sword, are found in a separate room. A recently published study claims that the artwork represents an ancient group of people's understanding of the universe, divided into the sky, earth, and underworld. The drawings also symbolize cyclical processes of birth and renewal, including the transition between day and night and summer and winter. Of course, only the people who made the artwork knew exactly what it meant and why it was important. Early Monument Making Around 7,000 years ago, the people living in what is now northwestern Saudi Arabia built a series of stone structures known as mustatils. And they are much older and more complex than researchers originally thought, according to a study published earlier this year. A mustatil consists of a long rectangular courtyard with a platform at each end. There are over 1,000 of them, and they vary in size, with the largest measuring over 600 meters long and the shortest spanning just 20 meters. These mysterious monuments are spread over a vast 200,000 kilometer squared area. Despite their size difference and widespread distribution, the mustatils share common features. In fact, their form is nearly identical from one to the next, according to archaeologist Melissa A. Kennedy, who spoke with the art newspaper. She points toward these similarities as evidence of a shared religion in the region during the late Neolithic period. Some of the mustatils undoubtedly required a lot of builders because they're so big. Because of this, the researchers think that they were created by a highly organized society or a group with common views and goals. The team found narrow entrances into the mustatils' courtyards as well as circular stone cells. One site contained skull and horn fragments from cattle, goats, gazelle, and sheep. The pieces were deposited around a standing stone in what appeared to be ritual offerings between 5300 and 5000 BC, long before Stonehenge and the Egyptian pyramids were built. As fascinating as these discoveries are, they give us more questions than answers. Experts still don't know who exactly built the structures, why, or what specific deities the people worshipped inside the Musatils. Kennedy admitted that these mysteries may never be solved, but that the research itself is nevertheless exciting. The Osiris Shaft Under the causeway of Khafre at Giza in Egypt, there is an underground shaft filled with water. Researchers learned back in 1945 that tour guides would go down there to swim, but failed to investigate the chamber. Meanwhile, the shaft became a popular swimming hole and an attraction for people who believed that the shaft was connected to tunnels that led to the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx. After so many stories and speculation, in 1999, Egyptologist Zahi Hawass finally excavated the site, nicknamed the Osiris Shaft. His team discovered a complex of chambers descending 125 feet below ground and consisting of three levels. They found at least seven sarcophagi belonging to elite priests. Five of the coffins were removed from the site and two remain. The Osiris Shaft was originally dated to 600 BC, but many experts believe it's much older. The deepest chambers are waterlogged and previous attempts to pump them out have failed. Experts do not know where the water comes from, but its levels fluctuate and it's impossible to get rid of. Some believe that a partially submerged sarcophagus in one of the chambers is the tomb of the god Osiris. Others have suggested that the same shaft contains a portal to another dimension and that only people with the correct DNA can pass through. The coffin has never been opened, leaving its contents a mystery. There are also tunnels connected to the complex that haven't been explored and that may run for miles. It's possible that the network predates the pyramids, or even the Egyptians themselves. There is a lot more going on here than meets the eye. Lady Dai Construction workers accidentally came across a very impressive tomb in China. A noblewoman named Xin Zui lived during the Han Dynasty almost 2,000 years ago. Nicknamed Lady Dai, she enjoyed a life of luxury, including live musical entertainment, foods that were reserved specifically for the elite, makeup, and fine textiles like silk. Lady Dai's tomb remained untouched for nearly 2,000 years until 1968, when workers discovered the grave 40 feet underground. Much to the surprise of experts, the woman's skin, hair, and organs were still intact. An analysis of her blood revealed that she died from a heart attack. Nobody knows entirely why Lady Di's body was so remarkably well-preserved. Her tomb was lined with thick layers of clay, soil, and charcoal, which absorbed oxygen and kept the grave sealed airtight. 
but this alone does not solve the mystery. Shinzue died around 163 BC at age 50 with a host of health problems, including heart disease, gallstones, high cholesterol, and liver disease. She was laid to rest in an elegant tomb containing over 1,000 grave goods, including makeup, toiletries, tapestries, carved wooden figurines representing her staff, and even a meal to eat in the afterlife. She was placed in the innermost coffin out of four caskets that were placed within each other like Russian dolls. Her body was wrapped in 20 layers of silk and immersed into 21 gallons of an unidentified liquid. The substance was found to be slightly acidic and contains traces of magnesium, but its other compounds are unknown. Whatever it is, it helped to make Lady Di the best preserved mummy ever found. The Disappearance of Walter Collins One day in 1928, nine-year-old Walter Collins went to the movies in Los Angeles, California. He was never seen or heard from again. At the time, the LAPD was being investigated for alleged corruption. On top of that, its inability to find Walter was greatly humiliating to the department. The police followed many leads, but got nowhere in their search. Meanwhile, they failed to connect several other disappearances of young children in the region to Walter's case. Several months later, Illinois police picked up a young boy who called himself Arthur Kent. He told the officers that his father had abandoned him, so they put him into temporary foster care. State authorities sent photos of the little boy to California, where police showed the pictures to Walter's mother and tried to convince her that they were of her son. She insisted that the boy was not Walter, but the police captain persuaded her to try him out for a little while. Mrs. Collins returned to the station with dental records and signed witness statements to prove that she had the wrong child, but the police accused her of being crazy and trying to get the state to take care of her son. Then they silenced Walter's mother by throwing her in the psychiatric ward. Soon enough, a witness came forward and claimed that they were forced to watch the murder of Walter Collins and two other missing children. Experts found the dismembered bone fragments of little boys at the alleged crime scene, along with tools covered in blood and human hair, but they were unable to trace any evidence to Walter Collins. A handwriting expert compared Walter's handwriting to that of the boy in Mrs. Collins' care and determined that he was not Walter. Finally, the police stopped trying to convince anyone that he was. The boy admitted to the truth and revealed that he had used several aliases in the past. Two suspects were eventually tried and convicted of the murders of several children, including Walter Collins, but his remains were never found, leaving a shadow of doubt about whether he truly died at the hands of those who confessed to killing him. Mystery of the Rarest Motorcycle on Earth While performing repairs at a suburban Chicago home in 1967, a plumber found a rare Traub motorcycle hidden in a bricked-up wall. This Traub, discovered in its dark hiding place, is the only example ever found. It is a one-of-a-kind classic American motorcycle with engineering and construction well ahead of its time. But where did it come from? It was walled up and untouched since 1916, and the story goes that the former owners of the house discovered their son had stolen the Traub motorcycle from the original owner, probably the person who made it. The parents were so angry they forced him to join the military as a punishment for his thieving ways. Sadly, the son went off to fight in World War I and never returned. Before he left, however, he hid the bike and never told a soul where it was, taking the secret to his grave. It was finally discovered 50 years later. It's the only known existing example of a Traub motorcycle ever found, and the bike was found in fantastic condition and even still runs today, despite being over 100 years old. Nobody knows who designed and built the Traub. Historians believe that the creator was a man named Richard Traub, who lived in Chicago's outer suburbs. Back in 1907, he wrote to Motorcycle Illustrated magazine about his homemade four-horsepower motorcycle. In the letter, he included a photo of himself with the bike. Based on Traub's description, the motorcycle in the picture could be the one that was found in the wall. Another photo has surfaced with a storefront called the Richard Traub Motorcycle Shop in the background, further pointing toward the man as the bike's possible creator. But nobody has ever established for a fact that this is the case. Today, the Traub Motorcycle is on display at the Wheels Through Time Museum in Haywood County, North Carolina. Bermeja Island Several maps of the Gulf of Mexico that were created between the 16th and 20th centuries feature a phantom island known as Bermeja, 
located off the northern coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It first appeared in 1539 in a Spanish collection of the world's islands. The world map looked quite different in 1539. The weird thing is that later on Bermeja disappeared from all maps. A more recent search in 1997 failed to locate it. Interest in the island arose once again in 2008, when authorities realized that finding it was important for determining oil exploitation rights. An extensive study was carried out the following year by the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And, like previous attempts by others, the researchers had no luck finding Bermeja. If the island existed, it would give Mexico exclusive drilling rights to an area that is believed to hold vast amounts of oil. Its absence has sparked a conspiracy theory that the CIA destroyed the island in order to give the U.S. access to the area. It's also possible that Bermeja's presence on maps simply resulted from a mapping error. Another theory suggests that shifts in the ocean floor, combined with rising sea levels, submerged the island into the sea. This is plausible, since it's already happened with some islands off Hawaii and Japan, and in the Arctic. But the mystery endures for now, and we may not ever know if Bermeja existed or what happened to it. Dighton Rock Sometime before 1680, someone scrawled a series of petroglyphs onto a 40-ton boulder in what is now Berkeley, Massachusetts. Nobody knows who created the carvings or what the images mean. The first known record of the inscriptions dates back to 1680 when a man named John Danforth spotted the partially submerged boulder and made a drawing of the symbols that he could see. He suggested that the markings were left by Native Americans, and most modern experts agree that he's probably right. But dozens of alternative theories are floating around. Ezra Stiles, an 18th century theologian and educator, believed that the images symbolized a visit to North America by the Phoenicians. Similar theories claim that the pictures represent Vikings, Portuguese explorers, or visitors from Carthage or Asia. Not to mention, there are also allegations about ancient aliens visiting the site. The boulder was removed from the riverbed for preservation in 1963, giving researchers a better opportunity to study it. But they've come up empty-handed so far in their quest for an explanation. Dancing Plague For several months in 1518, the people of Strasbourg, Alsace, in modern-day France, were struck by a bizarre condition that caused them to dance for days on end. The dancing is described in historical records, but the reasons for it are unknown. It all started when a woman named Mrs. Trophia began dancing uncontrollably in the street. Others joined in, and they were mostly young women. Around 400 people took to dancing at the height of the plague and it's rumored that the sickness killed as many as 15 people a day at its worst. Local officials noticed the strange behavior and had the dancers put in the hospital. Doctors determined that they were not possessed, but that their blood was overheated. To help the patients through their suffering, the doctors built a wooden stage for them to dance it out. To this day, experts are unsure what caused the dancing plague. They believe it could have been a physical condition, such as food poisoning, or it may have been a case of widespread psychiatric illness, such as mass hysteria. Or maybe they all ate dangerous psychedelic mushrooms. At the time, the Alsace region was plagued by disease and starvation, and the people who lived there were known to be superstitious. It makes sense, then, that at least seven dancing plagues were documented there throughout the Middle Ages. Thankfully, the plague of 1518 subsided on its own after three months. The MV Joyita Built in 1931, the MV Joyita was a 69-foot-long wooden ship that initially functioned as a luxury yacht. After serving in World War II, she fell into private ownership and was chartered as a trading and fishing boat. In 1951, the Joyita left Samoa for the Tokelau Islands with one working engine. She had been scheduled to leave the day before, but was having mechanical problems. The vessel set sail with 16 crew members and 9 passengers as well as cargo including medical supplies, timber, an oil drum, and food. Several days later, officials at the ship's destination reported that the Joyita was overdue. The crew never sent out a distress signal, and an initial search and rescue mission failed to find the vessel. Five weeks later, the captain of a merchant ship spotted the Joyita over 600 miles from her scheduled route. The passengers, crew, and four tons of cargo had vanished from the partially submerged boat. The Hoyita had some structural damage, and the radio was tuned into an international distress channel. All of the lifeboats were gone. 
The starboard deck was covered in mattresses, and there were bloody bandages lying near a doctor's bag full of medical equipment. An investigation determined that the ship was in poor condition, and it wasn't surprising that it encountered problems. But the fate of the crew and passengers remains a mystery to this day. It made no sense that they abandoned the ship, which was extremely buoyant because its holds were lined with cork. There are numerous theories, of course, including the possibility that the captain became injured or incapacitated and was unable to tell the passengers that the safest option was to stay aboard the waterlogged vessel. In any event, the crew and passengers are still listed as missing. Australia's Missing Prime Minister Harold Edward Holt served as Australia's Prime Minister from 1966 until his suspicious disappearance in 1967. In December that year, he and a group of spearfishing friends stopped at a remote site called Chevriot Beach. While there, Holt reportedly got caught in a riptide and was swept out to sea. Onlookers called out to him, but they didn't hear a response or see his hands in the air. He was presumed dead after one of the largest search operations in Australian history failed to find him. Holt's body was never found, but the government went ahead with a memorial service five days after he vanished. It was finally ruled in 2005 that Holt accidentally drowned, but this failed to dissuade conspiracy theorists who have suggested that foul play was involved. Some believe that the CIA played a role in the Prime Minister's death. Others think that Holt may have committed suicide faked his own death, or caught a ride on a submarine and defected to China. But it's also possible that he simply overestimated his skills in the water. Holt was a seasoned spearfisher and diver, but even the best of the best are no match for a strong riptide. Leading up to his death, his friends and employees warned him that his activities were dangerous. In fact, Holt had a few close calls before he disappeared. At the same beach he went missing from, he got caught in rough waters, turned purple, and began vomiting large amounts of seawater, prompting him to signal for help. Holt blamed the ordeal on a leaking snorkel and continued to ignore the obvious danger he was putting himself in. Another time, he experienced extreme shortness of breath after chasing a coral trout for nearly half an hour. What do you think? Did Prime Minister Holt's recklessness cause his disappearance? Or were more sinister forces at play? Let me know in the comments below. And thanks for watching! Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon! Bye.